Do you want me to quickly review? Yeah. Okay. I mean, the general conversation, we're talking about postmodernism. So it's normally, like, I don't know if you've read the symposium where they pretty much just introduce the topic. They said, okay, we're talking about love, <coughs> eros, and then they say, they define the parameters of it, and then they get into the conversation about it. That's how that worked. But right. Um, so, so, yeah, I guess... Um, so briefly describing modernism because you need that to understand postmodernism. You know, it's in the name. Um, modernism was essentially reactionary to uh, like traditional. And I, I'm I know you want to split everything, you know, into different categories, but it it kind of was across the board: art, architecture, literature, um, philosophy. Um, you know all these different things uh modernism was reactionary to that because it felt it was outdated it felt it was uh at least as it relates to marxism you know too ornate too bourgeoisie um so it created a rational and utilitarian and uh simplistic um art architecture ma around, ma mainly referring to art and art around when do you say this started around to give a general um, idea of people I, this happened mostly around the turn of the century, um, like early 1900s, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it, it coincides with the creation of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it. I think it manifests, at least physically manifests as an idea best um, into architecture. Like, if you think of modern architecture, it's extremely simplistic you know it's just using rectangles concrete slabs big glass windows you know it's like a brutalist architecture type things so. yeah it, it's basically it's reactionary to the victorian area where victorian era where everything was um you know extremely ornate you had all these architectural details everything was you know fancy for lack of a better term um so it, it was reactionary to that um you know, kind of, kind of saying, well, th this is ridiculous. We don't need all this fancy stuff. Let's create something that's uh, utilitarian, simplistic, and uh, and it was all you know rational based. It was based in the belief that there is uh, an objective truth that uh, you know logic and reason were valued pretty much above everything else, um, and also I guess the core the core tenets of the belief was this idea that uh, work and progress and, you know, I guess the amount of work and effort you put into something determined how good it was. So everything was, you know, work hard, uh, you know, everything was about progress, work, um, labor, and that's also how it ties into Marxism um, with the labor theory of value, basically where it's not about what you're creating, it's about mm -hmm. the fact that you're working hard towards it. So so modernism essentially valued hard work. Um, and then postmodernism, I wouldn't, you know, I would say modernism is essentially the opposite of what came before it. I wouldn't say postmodernism is the opposite of modernism, but it is also reactionary to what came before it. So postmodernism is reactionary reactionary to modernism and it's essentially saying that uh, there is no objective truth there you know one art form over another one culture over another one is not better one is not mm -hmm. worse um, every everything has equal value you know uh, a really amazing complex symphony is just as valuable as a deodorant commercial or whatever um that's what they're practically saying but it's not necessarily what people identify as postmodernism. well yes so um people are i think you know like social justice warriors um kind of very far left people have taken this idea that you know everything's subjective and are using it um I guess using it to attack the existing system, they're 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 essentially trying to delegitimize uh, the existing power structure, um, 
our society has by saying, well, you know, it, it's all uh, it's all subjective, right? There, mm-hmm. the, there is no objective morality or there is no morality at all. Um, you know, the Western culture isn't any better than any other culture. You know, a one barbaric culture isn't worse than, than one that, you know, practices peace and, and progress. Um, there are, it's all the same. So it's essentially delegitimizing everything. So they're using it to delegitimize the current power structure. And then I guess this is how they're hypocritical in doing so. They're trying to reestablish their own power structure. Yeah. But even if you had this ostensibly pure state of postmodernism, wouldn't the postmodernism this is the same thing also that goes not with this determinism but I think it's also an argument that goes against determinism in a way where you say everything's kind of the same everything's decided then why even have a conversation why even try to convince somebody that that's the way it is now with postmodernism I ask if they say everything's the same then isn't that itself kind of a statement of saying it is better to it is preferable it's not the same to look at everything as a hierarchy as it would be to look at everything as a lack there of hierarchy. You know, it's kind of that whole thing like somebody says, oh, you can't judge me. By them saying you can't judge me, aren't they judging you in that situation? So a postmodernist saying the, the, the way you should look at the world is that nothing really matters or everything is pretty much the same. Then wouldn't somebody come and say, well, then it's the same if I look at everything like there's a hierarchy. Um... Ooh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because I mean that's uh, it's, that's clearly not the same. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I I think the main problem with postmodernism uh, is that I mean in it, in of itself it isn't really a belief system. It's kind of a a lack of a belief system. Just like mm-hmm. atheism is a, a lack of a religion, or nihilism is a lack of uh, you know, a belief in, in the purpose of life or whatever. Um, and so postmodernism really, I think when it comes down to it, is simply a critique. Um, you know, they, they use irony. Um, they, they critique existing systems. Um, and I think the reason Marxism, uh, you know, neo-Marxism, uh, SJWs, have kind of uh, taken some of the ideas of postmodernism mm-hmm. into their own beliefs is because their existence is exactly the same. They, you know, Marxism more more so than being a, an idea for a new system is really just a critique of capitalism. Um, SJWs, you know, instead of looking to improve themselves, looking to improve society, looking to create something better, they simply want to create a, uh, a culture of, of victimization and, and oppression. So no matter what, you know, I'm oppressed because I'm this gender, this race, blah, blah, blah. Um, no matter what, uh, you know, there is no ethical, as Marx would say, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. Um, so no matter what, the existing system is flawed. and there's nothing wrong with critiquing a political system or a, or a belief system or or uh, an art movement or anything. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when that becomes your sole existence, you know, when that becomes the fundamentally fundamentally what your entire belief is, um, I think there's a problem that lies in that. Is a, is a parasitic nature to this because it's relying on something else. Like the two things we discussed were uh, Victorianism came and then postmodernism came. I mean, then modernism came, and those are actual things. And with postmodernism, that's post. It's an attachment. It the post doesn't exist by itself. It has to be built off of something else. Right. So you'd say, I'd say maybe this is like Victorianism is saying maybe two times two equals four, or something. and then now the Modernism says no. Two plus two still exists. Yes, but the key thing is to say two divided by two equals one. 
Now, postmodernism would be somebody coming in and saying, math, blah, we shouldn't even talk about math, let's erase the board. Would you say that would be kind of a good analogy where postmodernism might be more of like a reset or more of like an erasure of the things that came before and doesn't really propose a structure to actually build anything on? It doesn't really give, it doesn't really give much to work with. It's more like, don't work with that. Don't work with what was there before, but people still... I think have an urge for for some kind of guidance, not guidance, but some kind of structure to say, okay, how are we approaching this topic? But with postmodernism, they say it doesn't matter how you approach a topic. The topic doesn't even matter yet. Victorianism and modernism, if I'm understanding right, those were different proposals on how to approach certain things. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think, um, yes, modernism, even though it is reactionary, still proposes a solution yeah and uh and i think that is the problem with postmodernism and uh this kind of i guess nihilistic attitude that uh manifests itself in society today it's 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 like people are you know they feel like they kind of feel like what's the point we have you know there's nothing to strive to there's yeah. no uh there's no greater good to work towards. There's nothing to accomplish in this life. So let's just sabotage the existing system that exists because it's, you know, it's uh, oppressive and racist and et cetera, et cetera. Now, with, with that, why do you think that would actually reach out to someone? Why would that be something that some, someone would find any sort of appeal in that kind of system? Well, I think the appeal is you don't have to put any effort into it. Um, you don't have to concern yourself with being right because pretty much every your response to everything is, oh, well, that's subjective. Oh, well, that, that doesn't matter. Um, so I think it's appealing because it's easy. Um, but I think also the bigger problem in this day and age is we don't have an alternative. Um, there is no modernism, there is no traditionalism, although I think there has been a rise in traditionalism just because people are kind of looking back at the past and mm -hmm. looking towards, you know, in the past people had all these great ideals and all this, um, you know, this greater good to strive for and, uh, and you know, these achievements to strive for. Um, so let's mimic the way it was back then or revert back to that because that's the only thing we can find. Yeah. Um, and I think the problem now with the right wing um, in response to a lot of these, you know, SJWs and uh, Antifa and, you know, postmodernists is their belief system, their existence is just becoming a critique of postmodernism. So you're critiquing a belief system that is also just critiquing another belief system. Um, and I, you know, I've seen from the right a lot, I've seen a lot of, uh, I'll call it whataboutism, mm -hmm. where any, any uh, critique of Trump, any critique of the current you know establishment yeah. any critique of uh you know any right-wing belief is just met with well what about this well what about obama he did this in in 2011 or whatever what about hillary blah 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 uh what well you know what about your belief systems you believe this um and i think regardless of what you believe where you find yourself politically or philosophically uh you know, not that it's worthwhile to point out hypocrisies or, or critique someone else for their beliefs, but um, I think if you don't have a solid alternative or, a, you know, a solid solution to what you're critiquing, I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. Because that's essentially how you wind up with things like the Soviet Union and uh, Communist China, where they're, they're essentially saying, well, Capitalism is bad, so let's just get rid of it, and and they don't have that much of a solution there afterwards. So it actually makes things incredibly worse than it was before. Yeah, without taking things away, it doesn't take away the need of that thing. So it's leaves a vacuum that's this 
I don't know vacuum because it's not necessarily vacuum because as we discussed, these people just use these as tools to take something away. They erase something and then they want to step in and take the position that was left. So, hmm. With how this appeals to people, and why did, do you think postmodernism is a thing? I know, you, of course, you have more, more experience with it happening in the United States of America. And then, of course, we're here in the New York area. Do you think this is something that's spread out as much? I don't know if you had any experience outside of the United States, or do you think this is something that might be might be more endemic or more typical of living in a large metropolitan area? Is there certain aspects of the history with the country, or I don't know? I'm, tr- I'm trying to get to a no, no, no. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't think it's. Well, I do think you, obviously you see more of this in the United in the United States and uh, like Canada and um, you know England, um, just because I think you know the third world and and second world nations. Um, most people they don't have time to concern themselves with this to begin with at all. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, their purpose in life is survival. Their purpose in life is providing for their family, and even uh, first gener- first generation immigrant families. You know, it's getting their kids through college. It's you know, making sure their children do better than they are. Um, so I think it's mainly happening to in areas where survival is not really that big of an issue like well that we're talking about direct biological <clears throat> survival like uh, maslow's hierarchy of needs where it's you're dealing with where your next meal is coming from so your main physical direct survival needs but when it comes down to it when you see these people out in the streets i've been to some events <clears throat> and you've been to some too and that's one thing i keep questioning i keep wondering are these people truly in a state where they feel that they're threatened now, am I discounting their actual fears by trying to project what my value sets are on them? Just like the same way how, I think I might have asked you this question before, but I've used this question before, where somebody who says, okay, I want to have a burger right now. Some people may only think, okay, McDonald's is the best burger, I'm going to have that. Then some people may have had Burger King, may have had Wendy's, may have had Chick-fil-A, different kinds of burgers. So they have a wider scope of what kind of result is going to achieve that I want a burger feeling. So when we're saying, okay, these people have the different hierarchy of needs, the same people in developing countries, they don't really bother about these things because they're still worried about the life or death things. Some of these people, some of these Antifa people out there, going out there hitting people with bike locks, getting jail time, they seem to be convinced it's a life or death matter for them. Now, how do they define life or death is another another issue. Well, um... I think the reason you see that, um, and you know, like you said, I, I might be projecting myself onto them a little bit, but I think, for one, we have this idea that uh, that there's value in being oppressed, that simply being oppressed or simply being uh, lower on a power structure or somehow you know, disadvantage inherently makes you good or gives you some sort of value. Um, I don't think postmodernism, well, obviously postmodernism doesn't say that because, Mm -hmm. you know, everything's subjective, but I do think the whole social justice warrior movement is is based on the idea that um, the more oppressed you are, the, the better it is. Like, people want to be oppressed because it, it kind of justifies their I guess lack of success or, or lack of of happiness or, or what you know yeah. um, and I think the reason you have groups like Antifa is you know it being in a first world nation there's not a lot of actual threats out there so when when you when you're when you have this idea that you need to be oppressed to to gain some sort of merit to you know 
to e either justify your, your lack of success or, or lack of whatever in your life um, or to, you know, gain some sort of, uh, uh, you know, essentially be better than someone because you're mm -hmm. more oppressed than them. Um, they go out and they look for ways to be oppressed even when if they weren't out there looking for it uh, It probably wouldn't affect them very much if not at all One thing with this I wonder with this is the oppression statement is we do agree that I mean we were in the general agreement that the state itself is an agent of force is is implicit force in there being a state now with that general assumption agreed on or that general uh, hypothesis or agreement or definition of what the state is inherently if the United States has the largest state in the world then technically there is oppression everywhere when they're talking about this everywhere patriarchy or this microaggressions that are everywhere that are constant I'm starting to wonder is a simple thing is going to this going to um, somebody who wants to get their hair done they have to go I was just in this small town in Jersey not a small town it was a town in Jersey I mean, small. Town? every every place seems small <laughs> like living in New York yeah, City yeah, yeah. you step on you're like oh this is a small place it's like 50,000 people uh -huh. living here but oh it's a small place <laughs> but, what, uh, what town was it I'm it was like curious. Union or something oh okay um, have you been there that's not a small town. Yes, yeah, <laughs> even for me. I was like, just driving through, and I was like, "Okay, this seemed like okay." It wasn't fifty thousand; might be yeah. five hundred thousand. He's like, I, I, I come from a town that was like two thousand. So okay, <laughs> that, so, that's a small town. To me. <laughs> so I was like, it just it was a big it was a big change. I haven't really left the left uh, the big city for for a while, so mm -hmm. it was good seeing that. But just out there, there was a street with all these salons and people saying, "Okay, we need a licensed a hairdresser. We need this. So we need a licensed hairdresser, just somebody to." cut somebody's hair they need some kind of government license probably all the products in there they need some government license that salon itself probably had all these kind of um, different licensing and it had to have at certain chairs at certain heights it had to have certain electricity electrical the bulbs had to be of certain things you had to have 2.5 fire extinguishers all these things so there's all these general things that if the state is an agent of force and those things are implicitly there. Even if I just walk in there and choose to give my twelve dollars to the barber to cut my hair, that's a voluntary interaction. But it's only there in that state due to a whole lot of non-voluntary or non-optional yeah, non kind of things that the person has to do to get to that point. I'm even using the legal tender from this agent of force. So. Is there a possible argument that there actually is some kind of behind the scenes? I don't know if they say the background radiation in the universe, how you can tell the size of it. Is there like a background oppression? <laughs> like, I don't know what it would be sounding like. I may be yeah. like coming on the social justice world, but they might be actually pointing something out that actually exists, but they just don't know how to put that thing into words. Well, I, I don't think. Uh I'm not, you know, I guess I'm trying to discredit them, but I'm not doing it on the basis that they're trying to call out an oppression. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's one thing to, you know, you get a glimpse of something, like you said, like background radiation. You get a glimpse of it and you want to look more into it. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing. I I think, and again, this this is speculation, so I, I, I can't speak for these people, but it really does seem like, they're not they didn't go online and you know saw see something about uh you know the, the patriarchy or, or whatever they believe um and say oh i want to find out more about this i want to get mm -hmm. to the bottom of this they saw that and they said hmm maybe that's why my life is so bad maybe yeah. that's why i have all these problems it's because uh of all these privileged people, of the patriarchy, of racism, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm not saying that's not necessarily untrue. I'm just saying that it seems like they're arriving at that point through the wrong reason. And that reason isn't, I want to improve my life by figuring out how I'm oppressed. Mm -hmm. It's oppression is a merit, being a victim is a merit, and I want to... I guess achieve as much merit as I can by basically milking you know however much oppression I can claim to have 
Um, and I, I don't, going back to postmodernism, I don't think that the basis for the SJW mindset is postmodernism, but I do think they are using it as a tool, like yeah. I said. So obviously that does in a way contradict it, but I think they are, they're, they're very hypocritical people. They're using this idea, um, not because they believe it, but because it can help them achieve their end goal. And I think their end goal is, I'm unhappy with myself, I see no greater purpose for being here, so, so instead of just letting that be, I'm gonna take every, everyone and everything else down yeah. with me. Because there is something about that. With, with some of these things, I'm trying to get away with, okay, take away what people claim they're there for or claim to say they believe but what what do the actions kind of tell and that whole lack of worth thing i think is is a good position to look at more because again some of this i think comes from parenting one thing i think we all have in common is we all had parents of different kinds now the type of parenting that people had that's now a different issue and just as you pointed out the basic comforts of life people today your average person in the first world country lives hundreds of times better, infinitely, exponentially a better life, exponentially better mm -hmm. than kings did a hundred years ago. Right. That's, that's for certain. So somebody might, in our evolutionary environment, we understood if there was times of war, you wouldn't be with your parents that much. You wouldn't have that much of connection with your biological parents or your tribe or your... There was a reason for them to not be around. So we had that kind of genetic there. We've had structures like that. We've had cultures like that. So now you get to a point where there's unparenting, people are shipping their kids off to pre-K when they're like two years old, or in a couple of months they normally just let the kids go off. Yeah. Now you have these kids growing up, and then as they grow up they see, look, okay, well, we had a big house, we had food, we, there was no actual people trying to kill us on a daily basis. So they kind of look and then they think, then why weren't my parents there? Then why was I shipped off to this place? Why didn't I have more of connections? Why didn't I have a stronger familial or cultural connection? Why wouldn't people tell me you should be proud or happy to be living in this area? So I think that when you get in that situation, you get older and you're like, it's kind of a post-factor post -factor rationalization where for you to accept what was done to you as a kid, for you to accept that your parents only spent two hours a day with you, you'd have to kind of rationalize like they were actual threats your parents were out there fighting. And then your parents might come and say, yes, there is, it's actually a dangerous world. If your parents just came and said, no, actually, it's a rather comfortable world. world. We just chose to not spend time with you. Right. I think for some people, that might be a lot harder of an issue to kind of kind of deal with. And I don't know if you've noticed that, but I think that's one thing I've, I've started noticing and has just made me really depressed when I go to these events. I mean, I was following these political protests and things a lot more, but... I find myself going there and just having this, not, it's not even a scowl on my face, it's this this emptiness where I see people looking at me like, as I'm filming, I'm just like, it's not even like meeting in, it's like I see you and then they see me seeing them and it's kind of this moment of just like, don't look at me type thing, I don't mm -hmm. know, and they seem to be there on a look at me situation, yet if you actually, at the same point, it seems they don't want you to actually see them. It, I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, um, I mean it's a whole postmodern thing. It's like yeah. nothing is nothing. It's like yeah, exactly, is, exactly. It's going against it. So it's and and I guess they they I mean if they are postmodernists, they can kind of be hypocritical because hypocrisy doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> to them, it's, but, it's a tough situation. But um, I'm not trying to say that uh, you know people who may find themselves to be SJWs or find themselves you know as members of Antifa, I, I'm not trying to say that they don't have legitimate issues um, or that their problems are invalid. No, I'm definitely not saying you yeah. say that. Well, what, I think what, we're, what I'm trying to discuss no, I, I just is want, I want what to, are those problems. Um, and, but, well, and also, since we're not postmodernists, we do, I am going to say here, there is a way to tell which problem is more valid than another. Yeah. Like, I know that the, the state is a threat, but I would definitely consider... If a lion broke into this room right now, I would definitely consider that to be a bigger threat than 
pay taxes at the end of the month or something. I would hope you know, so. So, like, so there's, there's, yeah. there's definitely a hierarchy of threats, but yeah. I'm not going to say like just because they have actual threats means we should acquiesce to their inane demands. Because yeah, no, and I I would also not consider myself. I mean, there are certain aspects that I think um, that I would agree with, but I you know I wouldn't say say. Uh, like my example that like a, a deodorant commercial is the same as like Beethoven's yeah. Ninth Symphony or, or whatever. Um, but so so you were asking what those problems are. Well, yeah, what would what would you say some um, well I think the problems the problem is postmodernism itself. It is nihilism. It's that they feel they have no purpose. But okay, so what I, would I, the purpose I think be though? Well, I think my generation more so, um, there's just a, a general feeling of like, and, and I mean my generation as in like in the United States. Every generation world. is that or is um, or how we say that. Yeah. But I, I think there's this sense that, uh, you know, there's, a, have you ever seen the movie Fight Club? Yes, yeah. Do you know the line where he's like, um, I forget, forget exactly what he said, but Brad Pitt's character was basically saying like, you know, uh, previous generations had like the war, or the mm-hmm. Great Depression, like our our Great Depression is our lives. So yeah. it's like, there's, there's no, uh, like physically there's nothing to really worry about, but at the same time there's nothing to strive for. And... On the surface, that's nice because you're like, oh, well, I don't have to worry about anything. Mm-hmm. But I think it it actually leads to a lot of issues, um, and I think we're at the point, you know, where the left is kind of eating itself, and and postmodernism is is destroying people because it it's it's an empty pit. There is no end to it. Yeah. There is no uh, end goal or solution. So it naturally will destroy people and. Uh, destroy political movements um but i think we're at a point where you know people are asking what's next and i think um you know with with trump's election you're kind of seeing it with things like the alt-right not that the alt-right should be next um but i i have noticed a big rise in you know traditionalism uh kind of alternative rightist movements that are are very based in like like uh grand ideals like Mm -hmm. you know it's created uh essentially going back looking back at like um you know like ancient rome where they wanted to create these vast amazing cities or uh or uh conquer the world or whatever i think this attitude and and it's kind of you know, it's not concrete, it's more of an attitude, but this attitude of, like, stoic, um, like, determinism is, is coming on a rise in this day and age because, well, it's essentially reacting to postmodernism. Um, so it's trying to reestablish something. Since, as we said, I think we're still in agreement that uh, that postmodernism is more like erasure, erasure, it's a reset. It's not necessarily putting a new game into your system. It's pulling the plug from the system and saying don't play that video game so right. people are looking for more video games to see somebody smash your next gen video game they're not building a new generation game and saying okay you've had a playstation 3 here's a playstation 5 they're saying don't play anything and then somebody reaches back and says okay maybe we should play like nintendo or atari 2000 was it atari 2000 or is it something else yeah it's like way beyond your time yeah generation z people but with some of these things, I don't think there's going back on these. And I think definitely one thing I do agree is there is this grasping of people trying to reach back to something. And and I, I still think that also comes back from the same thing. People look back and they say, okay, we had this in the past, so let's try and bring that except times 20, and then maybe that will work. But the same thing I keep telling people. I'm like, look, if that is how... If traditionalism did exist in the past... And back then, there wasn't as strong of a negative influence of whatever you want to call it, postmodernism, or whatever the cancers that are going on today that they claim are cancers mm-hmm. today. 
if you bring that traditionalism back, how is that not just going to go back again to this situation except just a hundred years in the future? Um, well, I don't, I don't think it, it would necessarily. I think it would. Yeah. Um, Which is I, why I, I think we need something new. We yeah, need, like, no, no, that's, that's try, yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. I'm just pointing out, I, I'm noticing a trend, and I think we're, we're at a turning point. But I do think there is a problem with these traditionalist movements in that just like postmodernism, just like modernism, it's reactionary. Mm -hmm. So uh, modern art is only good or interesting because it's in contrast to the art that came before it, right? Painting three cubes on a canvas in like solid colors isn't a good painting unless every other painting is like, you know, uh, just portrait. realistic. Yeah, or, something, or just so. like, yeah, like portraits of of women or whatever um, so so yeah so it's only good because of what came before it now you would think that with you know the end of modernism um, and I, I think modernism and postmodernism kind of coexist because again postmodernism isn't really well it has to because the modernism part in there if you take the modernism out what does that post rely on well uh, I don't know about that. Um, I th I think it's more so that they're not opposites and they're not mutually exclusive. So, um, it, if to like really boil it down, it in artwork, um, traditional art, you know, picture like a, a Renaissance painting, like a, a beautiful Renaissance representative painting. of what's there. Right, more or less. Um, and then you have uh, modern art, which is, you know, and I'm thinking mostly of cubism because I think that's like the most, uh, I think that's like the best example, at least, um, of like pure modern art. It's just like a cubist painting. Um, there is no postmodern art. I think postmodern art, uh, I mean, you don't really hear about it, you hear contemporary art. Yeah. But, um, would essentially be so the reason all right I, I kind of explained that wrong um, so the reason postmodernism can exist with modernism is because postmodernism is essentially saying that nothing is better or worse so I think what you see with modern and contemporary art is it's justified by postmodernism right you're saying you, you don't go to the MoMA, see uh, a tissue on the floor, and and you say, you know, you say that's bad, that's bad art, that's not beautiful, that's not, there mm -hmm. wasn't a lot of work put into that, it's, it's low quality. It's justified by postmodernism. Um, and it, yeah, I, guess, I, I do think certain forms of, of contemporary art are kind of postmodernist in that they're, they're just, like, I, I really don't believe that uh, a lot of the people, you know, a lot of the artists in MoMA actually take their own work seriously. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, do you think they're trolling people? Which is kind of why it goes together with, like, the whole meme culture. Because yeah. some people do memes just to troll people. Like, these are the online political memes. They do it, they'll have, like, a Pepe with, like, a Hitler, like, mustache. And it's not because they really support the Nazis, but they're yeah. doing it because they're expecting expecting to get a rise out of people but now at the same point uh even if you had something that was very in the modernist sense of the art where you had the things that not uh, modernist but like if you had somebody like the sistine chapel that painting that was done on the roof in there that also was done to evoke something out of somebody now it was supposed to evoke a sense for of the transcendence i guess but it's still done in intentional to pull something out of somebody so when you're saying they don't, they don't actually take their art seriously, do you think it's a whole situation where they do things accidentally? And I have this series I want to go on art where I'm like, can art be accidental? Does it have to be an intention of creating art from the creator of that piece for it to be art? Or Well, I mean, that's kind of like Jackson Pollock, yeah. you know, where he would just splatter paint. 
Yeah, but you see, he's um, still intentionally doing something. Like, I don't really like Pollock wait. stuff, but it's it is still an intent to have that kind of... I'm talking about more like, can you just walk into a room and not know there's a bucket of paint there, and it's knocked over into a canvas, and then call that art? Um... Well, I... Th- I don't know, because, like, a, you're right. A Pollock, like, Pollock created his work... Obviously, it was very experimental. He wanted to try something new, so I, I there was good intent to it. But I also think he took his work seriously, um, which is why it's modern art, not contemporary art or more or less postmodern art. Um, it's a tough I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to answer your question. Yeah, um, no, it's it's, it's that's <laughs> why I started a series of it because I'm trying to understand. But I, I think know, a, lot of, that, a lot of what's expression and. A lot of contemporary art is that question itself. It's like, what will you consider art? Yeah. And you have even people reacting to that. I think if you really want to go like more on the troll level, um, I, I would say people like Banksy, you know, when he went into art galleries and put up other art that people thought was real art. Yeah. And it was, it was kind of a critique on contemporary art. So... It, it's a never-ending cycle. It's it's kind of like. It's kind of like plugging a program into the computer and just going crazy, um, because. You do you know with postmodernism. It, there's no limit to what you can critique. You can critique postmodernism itself. You know mm. it, it's just, it's it's levels of irony. I I don't know if you've seen those memes about like like different levels of irony. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, it, it's, when you try and, like, if you think that there's, not that there isn't any value to irony or, or uh, critiquing things, I think there's definitely value to it. Um, I think some of the value but, might be to create that something new, because I think one thing we agree on is postmodernism isn't an actual proposition. It's more like, stop doing what was being done. It's not like, let's do this. So this might be that, we might be in that transitionary period, like how did it switch from, from um, Victorianism, let's say we're talking about the social atmosphere of Victorianism to, was it Victorianism, postmodern, to Victorianism to modernism? Because now we're jumping between, there's no like Victorian right, I would say it was like, like, like traditionalism. Yeah, traditionalism to the modernism. Not even, because when it comes to the artistic aspect, I mean... Traditionalism, or I, actually, I think it's like Romanticism. Yeah, technically, is what came before Modernism, but that's tied into like the Victorian era. Yeah, um, and like Romantic works of literature were very like grandiose, and you know. So what, what romantic, was what was the period where people were the the kind of art that was being demanded by society and the general society was seeing in the galleries or that the big art uh, the art the patrons of the art of the arts were actually purchasing this work. What was the situation in that environment? What was the transition between that and then going to Pollux, going to things where there's cubism, going to things like that? Was there their own, its own post-X movement there before we switched to this new thing? Like right now is postmodernism just a moment of switching between modernism to whatever the new thing might be, whether it's memeism or <laughs> something like that. You know, oh, could that be a yeah. point where it's stuff like that? Because there's a channel I started listening to. There's a couple of channels I've been listening to which are going over the comic book industry, the American comic book industry, and they're talking about how that's a uniquely American invention. I'm kind of skeptical about that, having been having had time in Europe and seeing how visual... Uh, what would you call them? The actual term for visual narrative books are told like graphic novels, graphic novels and then having a big big obsession with manga reading a lot of manga and anime where there's so many fields there where it's so many niches so many specific niches like there's one I'm, I'm, I've been reading called Handakun it's about this guy called Handakun he's like an expert calligrapher he's like um, what's it called he's one of those like not a savant what are the, the a prodigy he's a child prodigy at calligraphy 
And then he all of a sudden just quits calligraphy one day and then moves to this one island. So there's one talking about him in the actual school as he was doing it. And then he quits and goes to this island and then picks it up again. So it's just about this expert calligrapher living on this small podunk island in one of the archipelago, uh, uh, in the archipelago that makes up Japan. And that's an entire thing. So you can't really inject social justice whiner and postmodernist kind of ideas because there's this funny story about this guy. Yet in comics now, they're infusing this kind of ideology. They turned Captain America into a Nazi. I don't know if you could... It wasn't a Nazi. Yeah, I think they did turn him into a Nazi. <laughs> anyway, they just did this thing where Captain America was apparently evil the whole time. And it just happened to happen at the same t- at the same point that Donald Trump won. So there's all these politics going in there. And some people are saying, wow, how are we going to revive the comic book industry? But I'm thinking, no, this is just something that's injected into this industry that was, I think, how old is the comic book industry? Maybe the 70s when it started? But that's going to create something new. Now the new form of comic books is going to be different. Now it's going to be people using Patreon, it's going to be more independent producers, people are going to be creating more niche things. So with this long-winded question, yes. is it possible that postmodernist, what we're seeing right now, is just something that's going to create different kind of art? In the political sphere, is it the transition period between the two-party system or whatever we've been having to create a new kind of system that works in the reality that we have today. Because sometimes you do need to restart the video game. Sometimes you do. You might need to erase the board and start again from scratch. Um, well, that's a lot. So <laughs> yeah, this give, is, give me a sec. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, I mean, it, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I, these, are, these are a few things that are coming together in this conversation. We don't have to yeah. touch them all in this no, conversation, no, no, no. but we can continue yeah. to build on no, this. No, but I mean, th- this is kind of what I wanted the conversation to yeah. culminate to is, is what's next. Yeah. Um, and... It, it, we might be benefited, though, by actually focusing... Because if, if I know we touch on different things, but then you touch on something else and it connects to one. So it might be right, so you, beneficial to focus on So do you want to focus on, on like, politically... More or less, um, it, if in terms of politics, because with postmodernism, let's say in the political aspect, it's saying okay, nothing, the values aren't there. But then now, me personally, coming from being more of an ANCAP, when I was actually, when I got to the point where I was actually more, I would say, sufficiently had su- sufficient information to make an educated choice on what my political opinion was, and not just taking in what was indoctrinated into my default position but when I was like okay I think I have a general enough idea of what politics is it's the way different societies and cultures elect some kind of governing body to deal with issues outside of themselves that affect them and they may take a part in that's just a general idea then what is the systems that are on offer then I kind of studied them and then I'm like okay from these I think at that point then you can pick one and I said all of them suck <laughs> I was like let me go to ANCAP because yeah. everything on the table sucks well do, do you but think isn't that what postmodernists are saying yeah. they're saying everything on the table sucks yeah so I'm kind of in agreement with them well, but then the solution of that is what we disagree right. on now so there's nothing wrong with saying everything sucks yes. that's that's not the issue the issue with postmodernism and SJWs is what's your solution but, but that's the thing not all postmodernists have to be SJWs, right? I think I heard something Thaddeus Russell saying something like this in the School Sucks podcast. I might try to find that. I might have heard this. I don't know. But questioning things is not... Being skeptical about things is not something we're against here. We're definitely pro that. But I think it's like, okay, now what? It's now that you've turned this down. I think the issue is now what? And the people who are using it the most are SJWs, social justice whiner type, where they do that and then they say, we want to propose what comes next. So that's, I think, the main issue, right? Um, yeah, more Like more you said, it's less. not saying... I, I, I don't think... I think there's also some degree of postmodernism on the right, on the right wing. Um, but it's essentially any anyone whose belief system is entirely or uh, you know whatever it may be um, is entirely based on critiquing and seeking to eliminate something that exists now obviously you don't necessarily need to replace for instance the state 
you know, if you if your end goal is to remove the state, I'm not saying you have to come up with a different state to exist, but you need to have some solid idea of what you want, right? But, and yeah. I don't think SJWs have that. I don't think they're thinking, I really wish the world was like this. I think they want to live in a perpetual state of victimhood where everything is, is messed up and problematic and, uh, uh, you know, oppressive. Um, so, I don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that we shouldn't critique things, that we shouldn't, you know, uh, poke fun at things, make memes, you know, use irony, whatever. Um, and and even if you if you look at, you know, okay, we have Democrat Republican parties. I personally think they're both flawed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really, you know, identify with either of them. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but. I think what we need to do now is focus on what would your ideal system be? How would it work? You know, if you could eliminate all these problems, how would you do it? And kind of have a an optimistic look towards the future where it's like, okay, yes, you know, your life sucks, you have all these problems, uh, the system's terrible, you know, it's, it's corrupt and oppressive, whatever. Okay, yeah. we get that, I don't disagree with you, but what do you want, right? If all these problems didn't exist, what would exist? You know, what's your, your I guess, end goal or, or what should we strive towards? And I think right now we don't really have anything to strive towards. We don't have an ideal, you know, as, as a, a collective cultural entity. Um, I think right now some people... That's a heavy term that needs defining, though. yeah. Because yeah, the collective cultural, like, because some people some people do, some people don't. And I think it's just the connections are getting wider and wider. People aren't quite sure what they're connected to, or they may have some shared ideal in one thing, and then something else they completely disagree on. Like you just see like the Bernie Sanders camp in the United States, they had things they agreed with with Hillary Clinton, and then some things they did not. So some people jumped ship, some people didn't vote. Some people even went all the way to the Trump side of the things. Then you see, of course, now with the rhinos, Republicans in name only, and the establishment, they're kind of taking in... They're pretty much being even better Democrats than the Democrats could ever wish to ever be. So it's it's kind of a situation where you're seeing what is the collective. And as I said, those people do have certain goals and, and things. And I think with the whole taking down of things, if you take something down like the state and you're premise for this that I happen to share and agree with is growth of the state is not necessarily pro-life, it's actually almost anti-life anti-better quality of life for everyone so that's kind of a situation where you're saying we need to stop this in order to have a better life so you don't, just stopping it in general already gets that better life thing whereas some people are just saying okay we need to take this down but it's not really the goal of focus on better quality of life in general, but is it better quality of life for them now? That's that's a tough point that I'm still trying to parse out here. And but even just the term pro life when it at least when it comes to the abortion thing. Now this is something where you, you see I know this is a tough topic for a lot of people, but you see this showing up in different ways and when I was saying it's so hard to talk about these things in in their own little buckets and saying, okay, we, we're going to we're gonna close this off from everything else and we're not going to focus on it. But it seems some people who, the more social justice whiner type, these nihilist type, the ones that use postmodernism more as a weapon, they seem to be the ones who have less interest in continuing life. And then you have the more pro-life people have more structure. Even when it comes to abortion, they're pro-life even by definition. They're like, we want to protect the next generations. We want more kids to be had. In a way, in a sense, I think you can poke holes through that. You can probably poke holes through that, what I'm saying there. I'm just trying to build this uh, this idea up. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a thing where it's a self-defeating thing in and of itself. It's something that pops up in culture, in society. And since it's not based on any proposition of continuing anything or propagating anything, it just pops up to kind of 
leech on, parasite on, and destroy whatever has come before it, it has no way of continuing itself indefinitely. It's kind of a thing that it pops up, and then the, the organism that it's attacking either finds a way to overcome it and create a better form that's immune to it in the future, or that organism completely dies, and then whatever that thing that jumped up, that post mod, that post whatever thing that jumped up, came up, and since it has nothing to feed off of in any way, it also dies. That's like the cancer thing. That's why they say, "What's well, feminism is cancer, postmodernism is cancer, mm -hmm. SAWs, this cancer thing is an accurate thing because once the host dies, cancer doesn't have a little cancer baby that floats off and like right. infects something else." That cancer's purpose itself is to destroy. Well, okay. Yeah, and I, I guess that's the, the key difference. Um, like, like I said, there's nothing wrong with critique. There's nothing wrong with wanting something new. But, yeah, I, I don't... I mean, we... We've brought this up several times. I don't think SJWs really want a solution. Um, they want to be oppressed, but I, I mean, but that's been and I think I find that they might there's probably some end goal to why they want that oppression, and I think that also goes back to what we're talking well, yeah, about. They, they they want to put a face to the, maybe that background radiation of the state, that background threat of the state, and also justify possibly why they had the lives lacking of some of the some of the things that people in more some of the things that being exposed to okay for example just think about the there's a few hurricanes that have hit the united states while we're recording this at the time of this there was irma in florida and uh, what was it harvey or jose no no what was the one in in texas it was like harvey i thought there was an h i think uh, I think it was in Harry. Oh, but anyway, there was there's two there. But just think about what happens in a place when a natural disaster happens. Normally, of course, there's the undocumented shoppers, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> but mo mostly people saving, come together. Saving the shoes <laughs> <Yes>. from the <laughs> water. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, they they really care about uh, labor from developing nations. So they didn't want those kids to work in sweatshops to go to waste. So they had to liberate those shoes from mm. the stores. <laughs> but. Um, you have most people drop the different kind of things and they come together and they unite. You know, you knock on these stories about people who've lived next to each other for 10 years, never said anything to each other, and then this happens and this is the first time they go and they knock on the person's door. So that's from an extreme physical sense of danger and oppression. So I'm thinking some of these people are seriously just feeling that and then they're trying to put a state of oppression to match or to possibly call forth that kind of sense of maybe if they feel like we are actually in this sense we can have this unison. If we're all sharing this natural disaster it will maybe connect us. Those will be the bonds that can hold us together in a way because as you said I do agree there is a sense be it right or not now that's a thing we're not subjective we're not like uh yeah we're not postmodernists here so we're trying to say what is the objective sense of this sense of loss because that's something i do agree there does clearly seem to be something amiss something missing out there within, within different generations and different places where kind of floating out there so what is it why are they floating why in this time when you can technically be so connected to people why do people feel so alone so many people do that um well I do think I mean for better or for worse you know even if you are a, a member of Antifa or an SJW you do get a sense of unity being mm -hmm. part of that so I maybe that is also drawing them into it. it it's just a group to join um and they're kind of united in their you know their viewpoints and their beliefs um so I, I guess that is kind of a positive aspect to it. Um, but I, I think ultimately... So if you look at modernism, modernism had an end goal, right? It was order, it was reason, it was progress, it was, you know, 
let's create an orderly society let's you know expand build whatever mm-hmm. um postmodernism has no end goal except i guess the end goal would be the destruction of society itself i i see no other end goal to it so the question is now what either movement do you think will be next or what do you think a good you know what do you think would be a good step uh in the right direction like what would be a, a step in the right direction as far as like a, a, a cultural movement or, or anything following postmodernism like where do you think either so yeah I think the question is um, you know either as an individual if you find yourself kind of stuck in this nihilistic postmodern uh, mindset mm-hmm. or you know I- expanding it on to like collectively as a society what do you think would be kind of a good basis for like a, a movement following postmodernism well I'm not quite sure but I think it's definitely the reestablishment of understanding that there are objective truths and preferences and I still think they have them I think it's also just showing these people that claim to be postmodernists that and I say claim because as you said it's based on some kind of nihilist type of thing and these are the kind of things where I don't think there's anyone who's actually a determinist there's no one who's actually a nihilist it's kind of a situation where we discuss that with anarchism is anarchism ever is anarchism an actual practical thing or is it just an ideal that somebody can look at and say okay that's a good place to be but we can head to that way but we can never truly be completely that so why I say that about nihilism is if you're truly a nihilist, you just kill yourself. There really is no purpose of being alive if you truly embrace nihilism entirely. I haven't found one that, I haven't found an argument for, somebody could say, oh, there's not even a purpose of me killing myself. But then it's just like, okay, then why even eat? Well, you probably because, like start to do Yeah, it. like yeah. you just, you don't have to physically do yourself. You just literally would do nothing and yeah. just let, let whatever happen. Now, if you're a determinist, you can't really be a complete determinist because what is the point of even trying to make a case for determinism? Did you or, define determinism? Well, determinism is just saying everything's determined. Just saying there's no at all. The free will is completely out oh, of like, there. Oh, like predetermined. It's like, yeah. Okay. It's just they, they, yeah, the determinism say like, and I do get that kind of thing where people say, oh, if you know enough, and it's one of my favorite quotes is there are no contradictions. If you find a contradiction, um, check your premises and you'll find one or two of them is wrong. So building off of that, I can see where determinism comes from, where it's like, okay, something may seem shocking in if you don't understand what's happening, it might seem like a random chance. But then if you know enough things in the past, you can understand, okay, this came here, then this butterfly landed here, and then it it scared this little animal, and then this bird came and ate this, and then this bird pooped on this. And this person like was annoyed and he stopped his car to clean it and then he drove angry and then he was just a little more ticked off and he noticed that he hadn't wiped off his windshield, looked away and then hit somebody with a car. So you could technically say that was determined from that first like gust of wind back there. So you can say, okay, that was predetermined to occur. So people in determinism, I think that's kind of an example of what they say. And they say everything works there from step one, beat Big Bang or um, God or whatever everything was determined from there and oddly enough that's part of what got me away from religion was people saying god knows everything that's going to happen before he even created everyone at least this is the christian god so they say he knew everything that i'm like so why is he even why bother with us having be alive why not just go to end times to judgment day and say okay i know all of you are going to commit these evils so why even be born and live through all that thing so yeah that's what i'm saying with determinists why would they even have a conversation? Why would they bother to make a case of determinism? They already understand that I will never agree with them or I will agree with them on my own time. What would be their purpose to engage with anyone on anything and try to convince anyone of doing everything, anything? Or would they just coast through life completely? I mean, you could argue that them explaining to you, them arguing to you is like what determined, you know, is determined, like they're determined to do that. It's predetermined that they'll have that discussion and then maybe you'll change your mind. But then you could always just stop. So they'll say, oh, it's predetermined you're going to stop now. But then if you do that, you would just be completely, and they, I do, I have found them to be in general determinists to be rather 
unfun people to be around because they, they have to keep going back towards that thing where it's like oh no everything is oh there's no there's no surprises there's no this oh, everything was supposed to happen how can you truly be glad or sad about anything if it was supposed to happen regardless like like what happens in life it's um, it's kind of a self-defeating proposition I'd say right so so you're saying you don't want well, okay, so... so And, and I think they, they're based on similar things. The nihilists were saying nothing matters, so we should say away with everything. And the determinists who say nothing... They also say nothing matters. They're not on the away with anything thing, but they're like nothing matters, so your choices don't really matter. What yeah, They say your choice, human influence and ability and decision-making values don't matter because everything is predetermined. Nihilists say human choices, decisions, and everything doesn't matter because nothing matters at all because everything is pointless. So the different things, same reason. I mean, you know, different reasons, same result. I'd say, of do nothing. Right, but going so going back. So what what do you think would then be a solution to that? You well, know, the if, solution if to that is just people realizing that these are non-starters. These are not things to even waste your time trying to like entertain right. that we can organize anything on this and realize that yes okay that's a critique situation but no you can throw those out and then once you throw those out then you can start looking at now what and then that's I, I'm not quite sure and I'm, I'm definitely not quite sure I'm in a process of having conversations and trying to parse things out and understand where exactly some of these things came from and what to do, propose to do forward but not quite sure um so yeah that's kind of what I, I wanted to discuss is like now what um because you know what what you just said in in itself is kind of a a postmodernist attitude where you're just saying well nihilism is flawed determinism is flawed that's it um i'm not saying you can't say that but like i think the importance is figuring out now what that is I mean, maybe, maybe uh, you know, our current purpose now is to figure out what our purpose is. To, yeah. to strive to, to figure it out. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe that is the next step. It's just, it's, the next step is figuring out what the next step is. No, that is. I mean, that's it, the thing. Because both of the things, I think the positive thing about postmodernism and questioning those things in the past is that people, I think, became over-reliant and the reason those things in the past were built is because people were questioning what's happening before and proposing things you know people got to the point where i think they were too comfortable and they said okay let's just rely on what was done in the past and not really adjust to the changing of the times and then it gets to the point where it's like okay we've tried one side of it we've tried the other side now it's time to like retire that coin and you know it's like let's keep flipping this coin back and forth like now let's not flip the coin anymore now let's switch like dice or something now mm -hmm. there's like more options to deal with you know now it's not just a binary choice now it's like septory or whatever the hell you'd say with six sides of a, of a die or whatever and it's like yeah no okay now you take that away now instead of that let's switch to like what's whatever hex code they use to create like bitcoins or whatever so let's switch to that you know they, and this thing's coming it's like i think i read something about quantum computing being around the corner yeah but yeah so that. there's there's all these sorts of things that are that are i think game changers that we haven't really plugged into the matrix of what we can do yet mm -hmm. but i think a key thing is stemming this off and this saying we need to be postmodern with postmodern we need to be post postmodernism I think that's that's what we need to get first. Yeah, I'd, I and have, then be like, okay, I have let's, heard let's that term. understand. There, I, you know, in researching for this, I did see that come up, but I didn't really understand what it was. Um, but yeah, I think the the key thing is, like you said, rejecting like you know nihilism, rejecting this idea that that nothing matters. Um, you know, just because you can't exactly determine how much better one form of art is from another doesn't mean that one form of art isn't better than another mm -hmm. um and yeah i think the main thing is it's it's a shift in attitude from what's the point there is no point uh you know my life has no purpose everything sucks i'm going to take every everyone down with me to um 
well, I don't know what the purpose of my life is. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I should be doing. Yeah. But I want to figure it out. I want to improve. You know, the system is flawed. Oppression exists. Um, you know, there's all these issues with my life and, and the world around me. But I want to actually improve it. I want to seek something better and, and kind of, you know at least attempt to figure out what that would be attempt to how you know figure out how i could make the current situation better than it is and i think yeah that that's the first step it's it's stepping from well this is all stupid this is all pointless you know i'm just gonna uh, set everything on fire and, and uh, throw bricks at it, starbucks or whatever um into um well you know Everything sucks now. I, I don't like the current political system. Yeah. I'm oppressed, blah, blah, blah. But I want to, I don't want to be oppressed. You know, I want to actually seek positive change and make the world a better place and make my life a better place, um, even if I don't know how at the moment. It seems real. It's like, oh, it's just the whole like grow up thing. <laughs> and I saw this thing, it was, uh, it was just this little funny meme. There's this thing that goes on in the States where. I don't know if it happens that much in other countries. I don't know what the equivalent would be in other countries. But I think the equivalent would be like, oh, at my age, I was married or whatever. No, but there's one where they say, this old lady comes and says, like, it was just this, this me with someone who's like, in my age, I owned a house by the, like, yeah, by, no, I, back I in the I day, it yeah, was yeah. like, back in the day, I owned a house when I was your age, when I was like 20. Then someone's like, well, back in the day, a house owned, I uh, cost like $6,000, Becky, like, shut yeah. the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. So it's, it's yeah. the realities have changed, and I think yeah. that's, there's a growing up situation, and what does it mean to be grown up in this time? And, you know, people are saying, okay, look, we can no longer define being grown up as what we did back in the 40s, let alone the 1900s, and we can't, and I don't think you can roll back to that situation. And no, I, do I, I think, don't. Th I don't think we should roll back at yeah. all. And I, I, you, I would just, critique you can't. traditionalism yeah. in that it's it's a it's a lazy form of reactionism where it's like, well, postmodernism sucks, so let's just go back to what we had before that. But it's you have to understand that whole attitude is what brought you postmodern. Yeah. Right. That's what's created it. It's uh, it. There needs to be more self reflection. You know, it was either complicit in creating it or it was unable to stop it. So we yeah. don't need to bring it back. Now yeah. I know people. Some people are arguing like, should we? Put, like, and you see that happening a lot with the religious people saying, because Christianity left, we need to bring Christianity back. But then. I said, well, we're Christianity left. That's a thing. It's going to leave again if you bring it back. So yeah. we need we need something something else. And um, but that doesn't mean we can't look back at the past and and draw positive. No, there's definitely a lot of that. positives in there. And um, as even still right now, even though I would, I don't know if I can, I'm even comfortable saying this, but um, I'm trying to think like, would I want to go back to bringing? Because I'm thinking about when would it be that I can't think of a time in my life of going back to that sort of Christianity where I also don't remember that that sort of Christianity also just quickly left or had some more negative aspects of it. Because they social justice warriors used to be Christians. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's yeah. no there's no denying that when you look at, you look at not, the rest, not too long ago social too. justice warriors were Christians. Because uh, so. like the whole thing with Eminem and when he got yeah. sued for those lyrics in the song, like those were all like fundamentalist Christians and they're essentially doing what SJWs are doing now. Yeah. You know, they're trying to censor free speech because they don't like what they're hearing. It's you know? just the new religion of the day is social justice whiners. And, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. We've been going for a while here. I don't know if we can wind it down and pick this back up. Um, well, we've essentially concluded that yeah. we, we don't know what's next. So. Don't know what's next. So, what, uh, do we know what's next to talk about? <laughs> we don't know what's next on that. <laughs> I, I don't as, know. As well. I, I think, I think we've kind of went full circle here. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Maybe do you have any? No. Um. Well, I think that's that's the thing. The, the what's next thing is is a good thing to focus on. We've touched on some topics. Will we listen to this and try to see if I can pull out some? Specifics, and if anybody listening to this has any suggestions or things you guys think we should expand on or you found interesting, we'd also be open to hearing from you guys. And um, 
I don't know. We'll think if there's any pertinent links that we can add to this, maybe to have you guys think about it. Yeah, that's again goes back through thinking of what we talked about and seeing, okay, I might have heard this from somewhere. I think I'll try to put something with the. If I can find that thing with Thaddeus Russell that I mentioned, I'll try to add that. He was. He was in the School Sucks podcast, and he's been talking about postmodernism, I think, in a more different way than I heard. It was just one podcast I listened to, but he had a different angle on it than I think a lot of other people did. And you said you suggested some of the Jordan Peterson stuff? Yeah, because he, he mentions uh, postmodernism a lot, and okay. I, think, I think he has a good take on it. So we'll see if there's any specific ones you find. Yeah. We can add that to below. And like I said, we this is a tough topic. It's not, it's not something uh, you can just condense and we've, we've tried we and tried we, to. We, we, we're meandering around yeah. but uh i hope you guys enjoyed it anything else to say i think we're all set yeah okay so uh like share and subscribe and uh till next video this is silas and this is nick goodbye <laughs>